by the way, I'd like to say a very big thanks to Lee Adamson of the IMO, who is God, who not only for coming, but for doing triple duty today, because he <coughs> kindly volunteered to be on every single panel, the balance water treatment, the sulfur cap, and the decarbonization. So thank you for, uh, for this. <coughs> And if you allow me to make a plug for the Greek colors, uh, I want to, uh, to say to Konstantinos uh, Tabedakis of Erma first, you saw, the, uh, you saw the page with all the uh, ballast water treatment systems. That's the only one from Greece that has uh, gotten uh, cost cut approval and is widely globally recognized. So Konstantinos, thank you for making us proud. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Nicolas, for putting another excellent forum on operational excellence in shipping. We do need, from time to time, to get together, all of us, from the regulators that they are on my left, to the company representatives and also to the manufacturer of the systems that we need to comply with the regulations. Allow me for a short introduction on the subject of ballast water management. That, as you know, IMO, US Coast Guard, flag states like Brazil, Norway, as well as United States states like California, have been issued regulation on ballast water management. Yet today, even though the IMO Ballast Water Management Convention entered in force on September 2017, and 79 nations ratify that they represent 80% of the world's gross tonnage, still there are many voices that call it a confused or a bad regulation. Recently, the chairman of the BW Group, Andreas Sommer Pau, stated as such on the fact that perhaps we don't know where we stand. The US Coast Guard, as you just saw, has about 10 type approved ballast water systems, as meeting regulation CFR 151, and I don't know how many alternate management systems that they were granted to operate up to five years so that the Coast Guard could have enough time to approve. And as you know, the US tests are different than those of the IMO G8 new regulation. There are a lot of other issues, such as how to deal with water ballast management system malfunctions, how to test the installed system on a new building vessel, what type of training and how much training the crew on board will require to meet expectation in operating the installed system, way too many ballast water management circulation documents from the IMO. I just printed a few and uh, I became an expert on the subject the last couple of weeks and also system, how to deal with system that, that complied with the old G8 guidelines versus the new one. What is today's status and where are we going on the ballast water management system and at the end of the day, is it again the ship and the ship owner that is going to be penalized or there are alternatives to the satisfaction of the port authorities and the US Coast Guard? Hopefully, our expert panelists will give some simple and clear answers to this. But before I pass the floor to the panelists, allow me to say a few words on a flag state role on Ballast Water Convention. As you may know, the Liberian Flag Administration was one of the first states to ratify the Ballast Water Management Convention as we sought to adapt global regulation versus national when we realized that there was not any existing technology, we submit alternative methods to the IMO as double exchange in deep ocean, and we fund it on our own relevant studies. And when more studies were required due to lack of funding, then the Liberian administration, with the assistance of other flag states and international organizations, submitting an extension to the installation for the existing fleet, justified by both lack of adequate technology 
for compliance system, as well as the bottleneck effect of shipyard availability. And Captain Menafi just mentioned this on his uh, presentation. In addition, Liberia has approved 25 ballast water management system under the old G8 regulation for installation up to 27th of October 2020. And after that day, we approve and we accept systems that other administrations signatory to the Ballast Water Management Convention have been uh, reviewed. All Liberian registered ships to which the Convention apply are required to have on board an approved Ballast Water Management Plan, Ballast uh, Record Book and International Ballast Water Management Certificate for compliance with D1 Exchange Standard and D2 Performance Standards. We are also interfaced with Coast Guard in providing guidance to owners and operators in making application for U.S. Coast Guard extension, reissuing extension letters with new ship names, etc. Last but not least, Liberia is participating in providing information to MEDC during the experience building phase <coughs> under IMO and have requested ship managers to provide data regarding sampling of treated water. Ba uh, ballast water and experience with installation of system. With this short introduction, I would like to turn to Mr. Adamson from the IMO and ask him the very simple question. Why IMO start thinking and alerted on the issue and how important this ballast water has been within the IMO environmental remit these days? First of all, let me, uh, let me give, begin by offering uh, something of a clarification. Um, I feel overwhelmed by the weight of technical expertise in the room in general and on this panel in particular. I'm not a technical expert. Uh, I'm from the Media and Communications Department at IMO. Uh, so basically, I'm a public relations person. So. Um, if the debate and the discussion gets into technicalities, it will very, very soon go over my head. So I'll offer you that by uh, clarification uh, straight away. Um, let me, before I begin talking specifically about ballast water, just pick up on some remarks that were made by uh, one of the previous speakers um, about IMO and the fact that it apparently creates uh, rules and regulations without uh, talking to the industry. Um, and I feel I must at least try to set the record straight there. Um, IMO is made up of its member governments. It's a body of the United Nations. It currently has uh, 174 member governments. But the decision-making process at IMO is informed and participated in by more than 60 non-governmental bodies. Um, and among those are included bodies representing ship owners, uh, of many different kinds of ship owners, um, uh, including the International Chamber of Shipping, but also bodies like Intertanko, Intercargo, uh, and, and so on. Um, also included are representatives of, for example, ship builders, engine builders, bunker supply industry, as well as environmental groups. So while those uh, groups don't specifically, um, are not able to actually take part in the final adoption of any, of any measure, um, they are certainly well represented throughout the process of developing uh, regulations. They are very active participants, and, I'm, and I think there are representatives of some of those here, and they can confirm that they are very active. Um, and their views and, um, uh, and their contributions uh, are listened to by the member states and very often what comes out from the member states has its basis in something that one of those industry or other um, groups has put forward. So I, I feel I must uh, clarify the record as far as that is concerned. Um, turning specifically to ballast water, um, I'd like to put the whole thing, if I may, in a global context um, and thereby neatly um, sidestep the fact that I'm not a technical expert. Um, but it was, I mean, as long ago as 1903 this issue was first recognised when uh, scientists noticed um, Asian algal blooms in 
the North Sea. Um, and uh, it's been a problem that's been recognized by the scientific community for some time. Um, it was uh, um, exacerbated by the growth of global trade, um, but specifically recognized by the United Nations Convention uh, on Environment and Development, the Rio 92 Convention, which I think is, uh, many people are, are, are familiar with. It was recognized as one of the greatest threats to the oceans and to ecological and economic um, sustainability. Um, I mean, to put it in simple terms, we've seen uh, things like the cholera pathogen been, um, been transported in, uh, in ballast water, um, and, and many, many other um, equally unpleasant, uh, unpleasant things. Um, as far as IMO is concerned, um, it, was, uh, it was specifically mentioned in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Article 196, um, and brought to IMO in the late 1980s by Canada and Australia. Um, thereafter was a, a, a succession, really, of, um, of, uh, of steps made by IMO to address this problem. So we had the first IMO guidelines adopted as long ago as 1991. Um, we had in 1994 a ballast water working group uh, at the Marine Environment Protection Committee was established. Uh, in 1997, the guidelines were revised and updated. In 2004, the Ballast Water Convention was adopted. Um, and at the time, the Marine Environment Protection Committee was also mandated to develop guidelines about, about how to do it, how to implement it. Uh, in 2008, those guidelines were completed. In 2017, uh, the convention entered into force. Um, throughout that period, um, IMO supported a program called Globalist, which was designed to raise capacity, uh, particularly among developing countries, about how to implement the, uh, the, the convention. So it concentrated on capacity building and training, um, brought out a manual on how to do it, specifically how to implement the convention. Um, it, uh, IMO developed a clear program of how to test um, ballast water management systems, um, co covering things like the, uh, the performance requirements, um, testing requirements, and so on. Um, a clear way in which, or a clear system in which marine administrations could give type approval um, to, those, uh, to those systems. Um, if you look on the IMO website today, you will see uh, 42 systems with type approval um, using uh, active substances. They're there on the IMO website. They've all got type approval certificates. And as I said, the, uh, as we all know, the convention is now in force from 2017. From that date, all ships had to comply with the D1 standard, um, and all new ships had to comply with the D2 standard. Um, and then there's a, um, there's a phase in period for new ships um, leading up to or ending in 2024, by which they must also comply with the with the D2 standard. Um, one question is why did it take so long between the um, uh, the adoption of the convention in 2004 and its entry into force? Um, and of course, some of those issues have been have been referred to. But um, the question really should be, I think, put to the member states who delayed their ratifications. I know that we, we in the Secretariat and our Secretaries General over that period were continually uh, encouraging and urging member states to ratify the convention to bring it into force because only once a convention is in force can it be um, amended should that be what the member states wish to do. Um, so we as a Secretariat, as I say, were um, were urging ratification among the member states, and that finally happened, it entered into force in 2017. Um, as far as the size of the problem is concerned, well, again, um, I'd go back to, uh, to this problem in its wider issue, which has been recognised not just in IMO, but in far wider environmental, uh, envi uh, environmental groups, um, and um, recognised as being one of the major threats to to the oceans, to economic sustainability, and to uh, ecological sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lee.
Now, I, I, Captain uh, Menefi, I, I, I understand that you, the Coast Guard, as you mentioned, is in a compliance mode nowadays, as fully enforcing the U.S. Uh, ballast water standards. You did mention uh, some of the frequent ballast system compliance issue, but uh, what is the Coast Guard is doing, trying to assist the ship? It's not only the ship that has to have a contingency plan, but sometimes you have a system where the system is defective, there is no availability of maker, engineer locally, uh, there is possibility for lack of spare parts. So, how the Coast Guard will, will try to address instances as such? Uh, we, we do recognize that systems do malfunction and, and break. Um, specifically, uh, something that uh, uh, ship owners and operators should be familiar with is the Coast Guard did issue a policy letter, uh, a publicly available policy letter. Uh, it's, it's CVC policy letter 18 TAC 02. And that policy letter addresses uh, some of the issues uh, that could come up with vessels uh, and their ballast water treatment systems. And it provides guidance to both vessel operators, owners, uh, and also local uh, Coast Guard units, Captain of Ports, in how to address uh, malfunctions and issues. Uh, and it, again, it, the first, the, the key part of that is, is certainly an early notification as, as early as you can. Uh, but the second part is, is that, that once that happens, uh, there is an onus uh, on the operator to show that they were maintaining the, the system as, as it was intended uh, and that they, they uh, were operating it, operating it as, as it's supposed to. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, if it has consumables, uh, the expectation is the consumables are uh, on board and, and available. Uh, uh, unavailability of consumables will not likely result in uh, uh, an allowance to operate from the, the local cabinet port. So uh, I strongly recommend uh, people review that uh, policy letter. I think it's pretty detailed in, in what can happen. Uh, often a ballast water exchange, uh, if, if it appears the system did have a, a sudden malfunction that is explainable and, and backed up with records, uh, a ballast water exchange 200 miles out will, will likely be the solution. Uh, there could be other issues if, it's, uh, if the ship is already in port. Uh, and that could be a situation where the ship may be put in a situation to uh, have to go out, uh, leave port, uh, go out beyond 12 miles uh, to discharge uh, untreated ballast water uh, if that was the scenario. Uh, we have had ships that have had to do that. And of course, it results in a significant cost to the operator uh, with different uh, tugs, pilots, uh, and so forth. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention, uh, industry is also starting to uh, come about to, to help resolve these issues. Uh, we have seen certain uh, companies uh, providing or, or designing systems that can be uh, deployed within ports uh, to handle uh, ballast water treatment uh, from the pier, um, uh, and also a uh, ability to uh, have a chemical treatment uh, within the port. Again, those aren't Coast Guard specific uh, initiatives, but industry is, is also starting to develop some other solutions that might be available. Thank you, Captain. Um, Lucas or Costa, if you would like to have an introductory statement on. on Thank you very much, uh, Mihaly. The, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, stop questioning uh, several regulations that come into force from time to time by IMO because uh, IMO is uh, there to issue certain regulations uh, for various issues, including uh, the environment. And uh, for our, uh, in our opinion, uh, when uh, these systems uh, start being available and they got also U.S. Coast Guard approval because for us it's very, it was very important uh, to, to initiate installation uh, for systems because we quite often go to the States. 
uh, we took a, a very early decision uh, to, to install uh, these systems to implement the regulation at an early stage, and this has uh, several advantages compared to the, let's say, alternative approach to delay things up to the last moment and take uh, extensions and extensions. Uh, so we started uh, very early. Uh, we agreed with uh, uh, an approved system manufacturer, and uh, we have already installed. I mean, by this year, we have installed. We will be installing about uh, eight uh, vessels in our eight uh, systems in our fleet. Uh, this uh, is quite demanding job. Needs a lot of training, but uh, a key a key point is uh, operation of the system because training is not sufficient. It's never sufficient. Operation of the system uh, is uh, what trains the people to do the right thing. Um, and we believe that uh, by 2019, almost uh, three fourths of our fleet will be fully compliant with uh, uh, with this system. Thank you, Costas. <coughs> Thank you, Michale. Um, okay, from the manufacturer's perspective, first of all, uh, Ermafest uh, has been one of the first uh, companies that uh, received the US Coast Guard uh, type approval, which uh, for us uh, was and still is uh, the golden rule. Um, going through this process, we have updated and we have optimized uh, the system uh, to the details because the system available now is the same as uh, the one we were launching uh, since uh, 2015. So far we are uh, gathering data from 230 vessels which are uh, operating our system uh, and uh, those 230 vessels uh, have equipped with uh, 350 Ermafirst ballast water treatment systems. This is a valuable information because uh, we've seen the transformation uh, of, uh, of, of the industry. Um, I dare to say that today uh, we moved uh, from the uncertainty era. Back in the, in, in, in the past uh, we were talking about which technology is suitable for my, for my vessel, which maker, will it work? Nowadays uh, we are we are into the experience phase. We're hearing more and more statements like, I have done it, I'm operating a system, I'm troubleshooting a system, I'm collecting data from a system, and most importantly, I'm training the officers and the crew how to operate the system and how to make it uh, compliant. This is uh, something which proves uh, the progress. Now, with regards to the future, we see that uh, the IMO is moving. Um, um, we've seen in the uh, last week's MPC uh, that uh, IMO has adapted uh, a circular which supports the validation of system performance during commissioning. This is an important uh, uh, subject which was not uh, uh, covered uh, until today. Um, we've seen uh, also IMO mentioning the system design limitations and there is a, a true effort from IMO side to harmonize with the US Coast Guard uh, system design limitations presentation of the type approval. And of course, we've seen slowly the introduction of the self-monitoring parameters of a ballast water treatment system. What this will do is uh, it will provide an evidence for, uh, to the operator and to the port state control, firstly, that the system operates within its design limitation, and secondly, and most important, that the system is operating within its design criteria. Those two things will prove compliance. Last but not least, um, as uh, Mr. Lucas mentioned, we have realized that the installation of a system on board a vessel is similar to, net, to uh, an engagement. If we were talking for new builds, it's 20 to 25 years. If we're talking about, uh, uh, for retrofits, it's 10 to 15 years, where the operator and the ballast water treatment uh, system maker 
should cooperate in order to make the vessels to be compliant. Thank you. Thank you all for the first uh, round. Now, on a, on a couple of practical issues, since you have mentioned, Lucas, that uh, you have already started, can you give us a sense of numbers or uh, cost uh, and the, the time to train the crew? How much? Okay, I, I cannot give you costs, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, each system that you you intend to retrofit uh, and in a ship uh, needs a substantial effort because you need to do, first of all, you need to select the equipment and uh, the appropriate technology. For example, if you have a, a, a ship that is only in, a, in a, let's say, a lake water, you need to to consider other technologies compared to what, uh, what, what uh, you have, let's say, if you do the normal trading in, uh, in the oceans. Uh, the second point is you need to have a, a liable manufacturer that, uh, as uh, Costadino said just before, it will be it will be nearby you for the for a whole period of time and will be supportive. Uh, the third point is you need to have a very good engineering team because uh, uh, ballast water treatment is uh, itself is uh, quite I mean uh, scavenge also uh, similar. I mean, uh, you need to do a lot of attention, a lot, a lot of detail engineering and. Uh, uh, you need to have everything. If you do the right job, then you can minimize the time that you will be will be staying in the in the shipyard for uh, uh, retrofitting. Uh, as I said before, uh, the crewing uh, the I mean such systems like uh, Ermafer system that we are using in uh, say Bulgars um, is uh, it's not so difficult to operate. It's quite easy to operate. Uh, the issue comes when you have uh, problems to resolve. And uh, you never know <laughs> what are the problems that you need to resolve. So what you really need to do is to operate the system continuously. Uh, so I, I need to urge everybody here that uh, you need to operate, you need to do mistakes. I think the authorities are always helpful uh, when you declare that we have a problem. Uh, and uh, so to be able to train and uh, reach compliance after, uh, let's say, a certain period of time. That's why you have started, started quite early. In, uh, since last year we're installing uh, the system and uh, I think that uh, our experience in uh, these uh, eight ships that we, are, we have installed is uh, very good because uh, uh, our crew is learning and uh, by after one or two years we reach let's say this mass of crew that will know how to operate the system. But is it too much asking the crew? One more training, one more system, something you Look, need. Look, I, I, I tell you, if it's too much or, or too less, it's uh, not a question because you need to do what you need to do. For example, back in 2004, when we adapted a new uh, ERP system, uh, it was uh, too much to ask the crew to adapt this uh, ERP system. And then uh, you have other regulations, you have to comply. I think right now you have all the automations that uh, you may need. You have, let's say, panels uh, that are uh, just uh, just uh, <coughs> play. Uh, you need to, uh, to, you cannot always say and you to avoid the responsibility that the shipping industry has against the environment and say, let's delay, let's delay, because this is the easy part. If you delay, I mean, the, the IMO regulation delayed uh, so many years uh, to be implemented, and uh, this I don't think was uh, helpful for the environment. Uh, so the initial tactic always is let's try to to delay it. I think the best approach is uh, let's try, try to implement it, try to learn from the mistakes, and continue the implementation. Thank you. Costas, would you like to add something on the training front? What? Uh... Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, training has been identified. Um, during the first uh, couple of installations that we did an important thing. Um, so far, uh, as an industry, and I'm not talking as, as a company only, as an industry, we have developed different ways of training, like computer-based training, simulators, hands-on uh, uh, unit, uh, hands-on training by using uh, pilot units. I'm not saying that um, those are not successful or efficient, but nothing is comparable with operating with the operation of the system on board the vessel. We have seen that the majority of the issues uh, we are facing is related to how the system has been integrated to the specific vessel. Therefore, 
The crew training, of course, it requires a preparation, um, onshore CBT training or um, um, hands-on training, but uh, we all need to use uh, this experience um, uh, gain phase, which IMO has uh, placed into force since uh, last year, until 2022, if I'm not mistaken, where the operators can use the system and can report uh, uh, all the troubles that they have without being afraid that they will be punished. Of course, uh, the situation is a bit different in the US Coast Guard, but still, there is plenty of room to experiment and operate the system and, and, and learn, uh, learn from it without having the risk of getting any fines. So we, we, we as a company urge all of our operators to install a system and start using it from the time that the vessel will leave the dry dock. Thank you, Costas. I want to go back to IMO and to the Coast Guard. And as both mentioned, there is a difference in the standards, in the Coast Guard standard on determining viability, key removal, uh, inactivate, or uh, the IMO that uh, in, in capable of reproduction. Do you see a common effort that will have harmonization of the IMO and uh, since uh, USA and Coast Guard represent, you know, a major destination? Do, do we see any effort <coughs> in harmonizing? Uh, from the Coast Guard U United States perspective, <coughs> um, I, I don't see any anticipated change to the, the Coast Guard's uh, ballast water regulations and statutes. Uh, they are what they are today and likely will be what they are going forward. Um, I, I, obviously, I think we are seeing manufacturers uh, attempt to get dual uh, type approvals. Uh, I think it's certainly possible. Uh, it, it does involve more work. But uh, as of now, the Coast Guard is not uh, changing uh, to harmonize with the IMO. Um, yeah, uh, from IMO's <coughs> perspective, and please bear in mind that I speak as a member of the Secretariat, not as one of the member states, and it is the member states that, uh, that make all the decisions and adopt all the, uh, um, all the policies that, uh, that matter to you people in the room. Um, there is an experience building phase, uh, which has been formally adopted. The experience building phase um, uh, is expected uh, to result in some proposals to the Marine Environment Protection Committee uh, in 2022 at its 79th meeting. Um, now it's impossible to say what those proposals may or may not be um, and um, whether or not they would include any kind of move towards the systems that one particular member state has in place, I simply couldn't say. But probably the best answer to the question actually has, uh, has already come from the US because what we have, don't forget, is a situation where there is, um, there is an international convention globally in force with more than 70 member states signed up for it, uh, to it um, and implementing it um, and one uh, IMO member state which has uh, chosen to go a different way, which of course it's perfectly entitled to do. Um, so I, I think the question about um, likely convergence uh, has probably been best uh, answered by Nathan on my left. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, actually, back to Captain Nathan, and perhaps uh, uh, Lee could also contribute. I understand that the US implemented the uh, ballast water exchange uh, from the early 90s, if I, if I remember what I read. Have you seen any new alien species and introdu introduce in the U.S. waters, and if not, will treatment with D2 standards be more effective than exchange in deep uh, waters under D1 uh, standard in introducing alien species? I mean, have you seen comparative studies then and now? Uh, to answer that question, it, it, I mean, there have been uh, uh, some new species introduced, certainly, uh, since the 90s. Uh, I'm aware of uh, a couple of reports out there uh, that have indicated uh, upwards of 40 new species 
uh, seen in certain areas of the U.S. since 1998. Um, so we do see the continued um, expansion of invasive species even while doing the, the ballast water exchange uh, uh, previously. Uh, as far as trying to compare uh, the D2 standard with the U.S. standard, which, which may be more effective, I, I can't speak to which uh, may be um, preventing uh, invasive species, though, you know, uh, more so than the other. Uh, but certainly the U.S. Uh, uh, the Congress decided that uh, the ballast water exchange was not sufficient to, to ensure the uh, continued expansion of invasive species could be arrested. So uh, we do have a, a, a strict standard that we see today uh, and, and even to where we've gotten into the difference between viability and, and, and dead. Dead is dead, that, that old argument. Uh, so we, we see that playing out and how the regulations were crafted. Uh, so, so certainly we are um, uh, more positive that, that our standard now, as it is ex exists now, is, is going to, to arrest the, the spread of invasive species. Lee, would you have any comment on this? I'm afraid I have nothing to add to that. I, I, I told you my technical knowledge or lack of it would soon come to the fore. So no, I have uh, absolutely nothing to add to that and that's very interesting, thanks. Okay, I mean, before I, I go to a final or so uh, question, do you guys, uh, Costas or Lucas, li like to ask uh, the regulators or the Coast Guard or IMO any question, you know, from your perspective? I mean, I want to give this opportunity. Yes, I would like to ask one question. Uh, the, we know that we have uh, two systems, two, two types of approvals. The one is uh, the IMO approval and uh, the second is the U.S. Coast Guard approval. Uh, what happens uh, uh, if a vessel has uh, the IMO and not the U.S. Coast Guard approval? To the, I, I, when it visits the uh, United States. Uh, if, it, if it has the IMO approval right now, it's, it's most likely uh, been accepted as an alternative management system, uh, AMS. Uh, and if, if so, the vessel would have uh, a record of that <coughs> on board, and certainly there's also a published record uh, available online uh, of what systems are alternative management systems. So um, there's a, a phase, a time period where alternative management systems are uh, allowable, uh, but that will come to an end uh, depending on the dry docking. Uh, date of, of the vessel, uh, so each vessel has a specific uh, individual circumstance uh, when they will need that uh, U.S. Coast Guard type approved system on board and, and will no longer be able to use the, the AMS. No, well, okay. Uh, before I open the session to the floor, I, I want to have one last philosophical type of question. Okay, I mean, we have, have today the IMO low sulfur uh, regulation, uh, we have the ballast, uh, we have the plastics under dimension, so I want to, to ask each one of you, your perspective, I need just one sentence, no more. Overall, if we take water and air, since Earth we know, overall is the alien sea species that will kill us, or the air we breathe. So let's start from Lucas uh, on this. Uh, our view is that uh, a protection of the environment is quite a, a broad issue, so you need to be protected from uh, hazardous emissions, you need to consider uh, how to transport uh, waters from the one uh, sea to the other. Uh, I don't think that someone will kill us, and I think that uh, we should uh, trust uh, IMO and all these uh, committees that work behind uh, IMO to the end uh, regulations. And uh, I think that also the regulations we have today will not be the final regulations. The regulations will gradually change. We start, we have uh, the ballast water treatment regulations, SOX regulations, uh, NOx regulations, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, by I think 2023, we have also uh, 
uh, greenhouse uh, regulations, which will change completely by 2030 the new buildings. I think we should uh, always be responsible, be ahead uh, and in the forefront of, the, of uh, technology and uh, try to, to implement uh, what is needed uh, in order to, <coughs> to pass the sign, the, the signal that the shipping industry is aligned with all the other industries uh, uh, globally. Thank you for the sentence. <laughs> Captain. Uh, I, I would say um, I don't think we can ignore the, the available technology uh, that exists today to uh, apply to some of these threats to the environment. Uh, just speaking from personal experience, I lived in Oakland, California uh, back in 2005, 2006. And uh, I do remember uh, black soot uh, essentially forming on a windowsill. We have our windows open quite a bit. And you'd have, after a couple of weeks, black soot, a layer of black soot on the windowsill. So, um, you know, of course, whether or not some of that's from trucks versus shipping uh, could be argued. But certainly the threat of uh, environmental harm exists uh, both in the air and the water. And, uh, and I think it would be unwise to ignore uh, putting in place some uh, available technology to, to address that. Costas. Okay, that, that's an interesting question, okay? Uh, um, I think that uh, none of us would like to die from none of these things, okay? So my personal opinion is that uh, neither of those, either of those will, uh, will kill us. The only thing that uh, will create issues on our health is uh, 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 our refusal to accept the new reality and our refusal to accept that something is not going wrong, something is going wrong with, uh, with uh, the climate and, uh, and the human... Uh, um, 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 the humans are, are those who are creating those issues. And Lee, last. Well, as I said earlier, I, I work for the United Nations, so um, I think uh, that does instill in you a sense of, of optimism. Um, last week was the annual United Nations Day, and from my own personal Twitter account, I retweeted a little something that the UN had put out, and it was uh, a little video, but it said very briefly that the United Nations feeds 80 million people, it vaccinates people against the world's, um, uh, against the diseases, it keeps the peace, it tackles climate change and it works for a better world. And I think when you see these problems in the broader context of how they're being addressed by the United Nations, uh, the UN may not get everything right, but um, it gets an awful lot of things right. And so I'm an optimist that neither of those things will kill us, that, we'll, um, that we will actually address these problems and come up with a good solution in the end. Thank you. Thank you all for a very good discussion. Thank you for your attendance. And if, uh, Nick, if one question or anybody would like, please. Thank you to all speakers for the excellent interventions. I just wanted to say that uh, ship owner uh, associations are very supportive at IMO, and when we express our concerns uh, in relation to uh, new environmental regulations, we surely avoid uh, generalizing, but we need to uh, look at the overall picture. So in relation to ballast water management, there are, of course, quality uh, system manufacturers and uh, many ship owners who can accommodate these systems. But the overall picture is that uh, uh, there is a problem with, uh, there are many problems with retrofitting existing uh, bulk carrier, for example, with uh, ballast water treatment systems. There are issues with operating uh, these uh, systems and issues with uh, securing 
sufficient to worldwide to support uh, for keeping these uh, systems operational. As a, for another example is uh, bulkers with gravity topside tanks, which have been a very effective and environmentally friendly, friendly uh, way of treating ballast water. And there is a lack of uh, sufficient system capacity to, to meet the requirements of these uh, ships. The end result is that many quality uh, bulk carriers are marginalized and forced to be scrapped to re be removed from the market. How will the international uh, trade needs uh, be met by building more ships? Then we need to think about the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions that will increase. So we, we, see, we see from IMO patchwork of regulation uh, that has side effects and uh, one working uh, against the other in many circumstances. Likewise, the sulfur regulation is promoting the use of some fuels while the greenhouse gas is uh, working against talking about LNG. So th this will be discussed in the ne next panels. I just wanted to link the discussion made uh, uh, in this uh, panel about ballast water and relating, relating it to greenhouse gas and sulfur cap. These regulations seem uh, irrelevant, that, but uh, they're not in the end. It was just a short statement. Costas uh, Gonis from Indocargo. Thank you. Now we know that Costas uh, speaks out of authority, so he can count the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. I think there is lunch.